Wait for five more minutes, or should we stop? No, no. Mm -hmm. Time to stop it. Mm -hmm. uh, we start in like five minutes. Okay. But we are all set. Well, this generally does not happen that we are all set be just before time. So <laughs> we'll still give it three minutes and then start. Okay, let's use this couple of minutes and maybe uh, we will have we'll discuss something or we we get a time to get one more extra question at the end. <laughs> okay, uh, so hello and welcome everyone. This uh, we are talking today about PHP design patterns, uh, Drupal eight, uh, PHP eight, and how it is how it all affects Drupal core. So before starting an introduction. Uh, my name is Ajit Shinde. Uh, I'm from India. I work as a senior developer for Cheppers. And like these are my Twitter and uh, Drupal.org handles. Hi, this is Piyush. I work as the practice lead for Drupal uh, with QED42. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, is everyone here comfortable with Drupal 7, first of all? I mean, have, has everyone seen Drupal 7? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, with Drupal 7, uh, uh, everything uh, everything goes procedural. All of us know that, right? Uh, right from your index.php file, which bootstrap, or uh, which was the entry point for Drupal, and then uh, a set of bootstrap functions getting called, right? So this is how your index.php file looked in Drupal 7. Uh, uh, its own menu execute active handler, which was the entry entry point for any menu um, any menu route. I mean, I'll call this as a route in, since uh, I'm doing more Drupal 8 now. But yeah, this was the entry point for all menus. And then the control was getting passed to, uh, to the menu callbacks via, uh, via the different set of procedural, fu procedural functions. Right? The only way to extend uh, Drupal 7 was using hooks. Right? And uh, how many of you faced? Issues or difficulties or uh, trouble understanding what are hooks? Very few, very few. Okay. And how many of you started with Drupal, uh, with Drupal 7? Okay. That explains it why. Because uh, 
I started with Drupal 7, and uh, I was right out from my college uh, doing Java programming back in the college, doing a lot of object-oriented programming stuff there. But suddenly, I was like, uh, I was introduced to Drupal uh, during my internship for the very first time. Uh, it's a PHP-based framework. That's all I knew about it. And then uh, the certain XYZ best practices to do certain things in Drupal. And then the only way to extend something, you can't, you can't hack the core, is something that I was told on, on my first day. You can't hack a contra module. That is something that I was told on the first day. The only way to uh, do something or extend something was using hooks. I was like, what the hell is hook? <laughs> is a hook? And uh, then it took me some, uh, a lot of time to get hang of uh, what hooks are, how they're, in, uh, how they're getting invoked, where they're getting invoked, how do you define your a new hook? Very different from a typical uh, object-oriented background, which I was coming from, right? Uh, the example that we've taken here is from Link's module, wherein, we wherein the module tries to define uh, a formatter, how, uh, how the settings form for it looks like, and how the view for it would look like. But yeah, all of it was like uh, really difficult for me to digest in. And uh, this, is, this is what the basic challenge with Drupal 7 was, actually, right? Wherein uh, onboarding new folks to Drupal was really difficult, right? And uh, since Drupal has its own way of doing things, the Drupalism baked into it, it was more difficult for Drupal to also adopt something uh, which, is, which is a standard across uh, different, uh, different frameworks which are, which are being used, right? And that's where Drupal 8 came into picture, the new and the shiny, <laughs> shiny thing, all of us. Um, but Drupal 8, uh, we s so uh, at QED42, what we also do is every year we have boot camps, which is responsible for training new folks with Drupal. They're these fresh folks who are coming out of, out of college. We saw a drastic difference or delta in terms of uh, how people were getting acquainted with, uh, with Drupal 7 versus Drupal 8. Now, uh, uh, for us, it was more tricky to explain them what hooks are or how do you overwrite certain things? Because people would usually come back and ask, why don't I uh, create a separate, uh, create a different class, extend it, and, uh, uh, and override the core functionality, right, with Drupal 7. But with Drupal 8, those questions were no longer there. Uh, it was much easier for people to ingest what's there and how it has been developed. And uh, comparing the index.php file, which was the which is still the entry point uh, for Drupal 8 plus, uh, uh, you can see there are a lot of uh, objects and classes being used here. The menu execute active handler, which was there in Drupal 7 for uh, for routing, has been replaced by HTTP uh, HTTP kernel, and uh, that is taken from Symfony actually uh, from a s from a framework which is outside of Drupal, right? And uh, this very clearly explains how Drupal moved from the not, in non not invented here syndrome to like accept everything which is a standard and implement, uh, implement it within itself rather than reinventing the wheel, right? Um, with this, with object-oriented programming coming to picture, uh, hooks are not the only ways in which you can extend uh, the Drupal core functionality, but rather it brought in more and more ways of uh, uh, writing code as well as extending what's there in Drupal core, right? For example, hooks, uh, hooks are still there, by the way. Uh, it, uh, it's going to take some time to go away, but uh, uh, it would soon be replaced with events. Uh, there's a plugin system which allows you to uh, create new pluggable components which would work the same way a base, uh, the, a base framework has been set up within Drupal. For example, your block system is a very good example of plugin system wherein you can go ahead and create new block plugins, right? And they all would behave in the same way uh, uh, as your block system is supposed to operate. Uh, you have event and event subscribers. One of the in another interesting things that happened with Drupal 8 is uh, now Drupal is not just a consumer of uh, external libraries or standard libraries, but Drupal can also produce PHP libraries. For example, while writing a contrib or a custom module, you can go ahead and write a new PHP library and make it available to the outside world via, via Composer package, right? And many more. Uh, now, since object oriented programming has come in, and uh, there are n number of ways of doing, uh, doing the same thing, 
It's also important that there are certain standards which get followed uh, while solving certain problem statements. And that's where uh, design patterns come into picture. I'll let Ajit talk uh, more about it in depth. OK. Uh, so this is sort of uh, the Wikipedia definition of design patterns. And uh, it's basically uh, very generic. It applies to not just PHP, but for other frameworks. But let's not go into much details about it. Uh, let's understand it in a simpler way. It's just a way in which you could write better code or a better way to write code which makes it easy to understand and maintain. Uh, these are some of the design patterns uh, that we will be discussing today. Um, and for discussing that, let's consider a very simple scenario of a car manufacturing unit. And just for the sake of example, consider these two. Uh, one is the car and one is the engine. Uh, the engine cannot drive without the car. Uh, but they are still separate. Um, just keep this in mind, and let's talk about how we can implement this scenario in different desi uh, design patterns. The first one is uh, dependency injection. Um, it just makes managing dependencies very easy. And, to, uh, and a way in which you could think about it is, let's say there is a class A and there is a class B. Uh, class A uses some of the methods of class B. So B sort of becomes a dependency for A. Uh, some functionality of A is not complete without B. So B becomes automatically a dependency for class A. And uh, to map our example into um, PHP, uh, we consider two things, uh, two real life uh, objects. One is car and one is engine. So an engine class could look like this. Uh, so it might have a type, it might have a cylinder, it might have a fuel. Um, and just for, for the sake of this slide, uh, there's just a speed on or accelerate. Uh, the way you create an object of engine is uh, on the right, um, just with the new keyword, and then, then call the method on it. Um, and the way car is created is, again, with a class, because we are doing object-oriented programming. Uh, so there's a car type, which could be hatchback, C sedan, or SUV. There's an engine, because a car definitely needs an engine. And there is an accelerator function, just for example. Um, and as you can see, because the car needs engine, the engine is created here uh, while the car is created. Like, can anyone point out a problem with this? Like, what's the problem? Yes. Yes, please. Yeah, the, we can't switch the engine because it's hard coded. Like, we, we cannot have a manufacturing unit of a car that produces only cars with four stroke engine and like diesel fuel type. Uh, how can this be solved? Like, how can you solve this? Like, we don't want to hard code. So, a possible way could be to sort of provide those as arguments as well. So when creating a car, you could then specify the engine type and then provide the cylinder and then the fuel, basically. So, uh, but there's still a problem with this. Can anyone point this out or? Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, so engine becomes uh, sort of a hard dependency, and engine cannot itself be extended um, as, as we require. And uh, it's generally the case that you don't go start manufacturing an engine when you start manufacturing car, right? Engine is manufactured way ahead before, ma before starting to build a car, uh, which makes it easy, which makes it easy to uh, m test the engine before and separately before putting it into the car. Uh, so that's the benefit. Uh, and in this way, um, the engine is more testable if we create it separately. And how dependency injection sort of solves this problem is to pa create an engine separately and pass it as an object while creating the car. So the engine is created separately. You can see. Uh, the engine is created on the right side bottom, like with the new keyword, and it is passed as a argument to the car, like the second argument. Uh, and it's basically, you can, uh, it is received in the constructor here, 
and then initialized. Um, so the benefit of this is it sort of becomes loosely coupled, both the car and the engine. It becomes very easy to test engine separately and a car separately uh, because you create a car uh, separately from the engine. Uh, but this is like a very uh, simple co application. Uh, in the real world, it's very complex, like a car engine in itself could be created with different part. And this is one of the part, it's piston. Um, there, is uh, there are other parts of engine like crankshaft and other things as well. And in turn, a piston itself is created by so many parts. And all of these parts sort of are created separately and then brought together Created uh, create a piston and then depending on the type of cylinders the engine is created. So the point is um, the point is uh, the engine is uh, the problem is complicated and um, and a way in which the uh, I'm sorry for this um, and and the way uh, in which these dependencies are managed. If you have to manage it by yourself, it becomes very hard because then you have to create a class for a piston, you, you have to cre create a, car, a class for a co piston crown, and then so on and so forth. Uh, and then pass it and inject dependencies and it becomes like a multi-level thing. Um, so the modern frameworks like Drupal do it for you. Like they provide a way in which these dependencies are solved automatically. Uh, by dependency injection container. So, uh, and this is sort of an example of a link formatter, again from a link module, but this is Drupal 8. And uh, all, it d all uh, in a way, link module is different from the field or a normal text module is it needs to validate the path. Like it needs to validate the link. So it has sort of a dependency os on this. I'm not sure if it is visible, but there is a dependency for the path validator at the bottom. Um, and it gets passed using this function, um, which is responsible for creation of plugins. And these, this container provides this service, and it becomes part, uh, like uh, part of the path validator, uh, path validator um, method, like which, which is a protected uh, value inside the class itself. Uh, the way dependency injection is managed in a uh, service, because one service can depend on a uh, different service, is using uh, services.yml file. This is sort of a, <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is one of the modules that I maintain, uh, auto logout, uh, automated logout. Uh, what it does is it automatically logs out user if they are not active for some time. Um, and there is this auto logout service, uh, auto logout manager. Thank you. Uh, auto logout manager that again uh, does a lot of things. Like it, it requires all of the user, all of these other services. So we just pass them on in the services.yml as the name of this, and it they become automatically part uh, passed into the same sort of the uh, in same order in the constructor and then you can use them. So this is how, this is, these are the couple of ways in, in which dependency injection is done in Drupal core. Uh, the, the next pattern is sort of an adapter and it uh, sort of humorously f uh, uh, fits in the problem we just had. Uh, so this was a problem, this, this was a, <laughs> this was an image shared by some kind community member in, in the Drupal Slack ch channel in DrupalCon. Uh, which let you, uh, they asked you to bring these adapter uh, when, when you're traveling to DrupalCon, but my country does not produce those. So um, wh what we have is sort of a universal adapter, uh, which acts as a middle layer between the adapter required by Prague and the adapter created by, by, the, by my country, and that it sorts of acts as a middle layer and lets the system work. Uh, and in our scenario, let's say, uh, now we have sort of uh, electric vehicles. Um, and you can see that nothing burns, like there's no fuel. And um, 
the electric engines are basically completely different than a traditional internal combustion engine. Uh, and since our expertise is building engines and cars, we are not an expert of creating electric battery. What do we do in that case? In this case, we sort of purchase it from someone who is an expert in that. So consider this as a class that we are getting. So the, the, it's called like a third party electric engine. Um, and since it is controlled completely by a third party, we don't have control over its methods. So sort of, it does not it does not have an ignition like our system has. It does not speed on or ignition off is not present. But it's turn on because it's an electric thing. It does not ignite, it turns on. Uh, there's So this sort of makes it incompatible. Very similar to the adapter prob adapter situation. So one, one problem, one different system here, other different system here. So what do we do? We introduce an adapter in between. And that adapter comes in format of a class uh, you can see it here, uh, the adapter, it, it still implements our interface. So sort of the interface that is compatible with our system. So it, it, the adapter becomes compatible. And you can see that we sort of get a third party engine, like we purchase it on the right hand side. We purchase a third party engine. Uh, we, we have like, let's say 800 cell uh, battery type. And then we sort of pass this as a dependency inside the our adapter, basically. So we have an adapter um, and pass the our third party engine, engine as a dependency injection um, and receive it here and then engine. And so uh, you can see that the methods implemented by the adapter are all from the interface. It has ignition, it has speed on, it has ignition off. And this calls in the methods inside, inside it basically calls the method of the external external engine, which is like turn on, acceleration, and turn off. Uh, does anyone ha have any question? Uh, is it clear? Can I go ahead? OK. So the, a way in which it sort of is implemented in Drupal, uh, there are not very good examples in Drupal core. So I uh, borrowed this one from a contrib module uh, called S3FS. Uh, it in integrates um, Drupal's file system with the S3 file system from Amazon. Uh, so what it does is, you can see on the left-hand side, there is a service inside this S3FS module. What it does is it impl imports the libraries from AWS. You can see the namespaces as like all, all as the AWS namespaces. And uh, in, the, in the library, uh, in the service, there is a method called as get Amazon client, and towards the end, it creates a new S3 client. So you can see that the object is created of a class that is not provided by Drupal, but a third party library uh, provided by AWS. Uh, so this method will return an AWS object um, to Drupal. And the reason for writing this adapter is very simple. It's, it's like, let's say AWS comes up with a new API and they and the new API is not backwards compatible in which the way you create this S3 client, it takes an array, uh, but some parameters of the array or some keys of array have changed. So all we need to do then is to modify this adapter and like adjust the client config. And we just do it at one place. And in our Drupal system, we do not use this AWS uh, class directly but we always use the adapter. And that is how it makes it easier to maintain. So whatever change the third party has, it you only need to change it like at one place and it becomes more maintainable. Um, any questions? Okay. Uh, so the, the, this one is sort of easy. Uh, so uh, the observer reaction uh, or design pattern is just as the name says it, it's to observe and react. And this was sort of an example that I found. Uh, so there is this piece of code doing its own thing uh, in its own state. Uh, maybe um, some, uh, some doing something with the database or sending out an email. Uh, so whatever state it is. And you can see that the other pieces of code, it 
just are independently observing it, like what state it is in. And they may choose to react or not react. Uh, they may observe it differently. You can see that someone has binoculars, someone, I don't know what it's called, and someone chooses not to react at all. Uh, it all depends on the state, uh, the application. in. This is like an observer pattern in like layman terms. And uh, before, before showing you the code, um, let's say our car manufacturer wants to make the cars very safe. So in this case, what we have to do is introduce some safety features to the car, like the car needs a seat belt, the car needs airbags, it, um, there needs to be some warning systems. Um, and for the sake of simplicity, we consider this example of having a warning displayed to you when you reach a certain speed and you did not, like you, the driver missed to put on the seat belt. It's very simple. Uh, some car does that. Um, maybe with a beep warning, my car announces it uh, in a certain way. Uh, so how do we implement it? So the problem is, or the challenge is to uh, warn the user if they reach a certain speed, but they did miss to put on the seat belt. So how do we do it? So uh, basically, uh, you can see that. So the there are two things. One is uh, there is no seat belt and a condition where the you reach some speed, and then the system reacting differently. Um, and that's what the accelerate function does. It it gets the current speed, and if let's say the speed is greater than ten um, and there is no seat belt, it sort of triggers an event and like dispatches it. And in, in short, what it does is um, it creates an object of this. You can see the object of safety event and provides the event of uh, no seat belt. Um, so basically, just uh, and dispatches it. And there is a subscriber that sort of uh, listens, or there are like listeners who uh, listen to the state of the object, uh, state of the code. And they have sort of, um, we have written this get safety events uh, as a sort of a public method. And in, in case of no seat belt, we just sort of do warn seat belt, warn no seat belt. Uh, this is the name of the function it calls. And then it is uh, displayed. You can pass in more parameters and more functions. So it could sort of, um, it could sort of uh, do behave differently. Like uh, there could be, like I said, beeping, uh, some warning displayed on the dashboard. Uh, some some car manufacturers may even split to uh, choose to slow down the car. Like they they would not let you go past a certain speed. So and and there could be other events as well. Um, this is just example of one event, uh, but this is what observer pattern is. Uh, so basically, two. There is an event, and there is a reaction to that event. So event and event subscriber. Uh, the way it is implemented in Drupal, and this is in core, um, is and this is an example of the CK editor module. And what CK editor module configuration provides, if you if you are aware, some of you are aware, you can pass in custom CSS like custom CSS, uh, which becomes part of the editor, and because you can configure CSS in the configuration form itself, we need to invalidate some cache. So the libraries, the CSS libraries sort of need to be invalidated. Uh, so you can see that in get subscribe events, uh, whenever a config is saved, you can you just call an on, on, on save. So on save method is called and the cache tags are invalidated. So this is sort of the observer pattern implemented using event subscribers in Drupal 8, 8 plus. Um, so this sort of completes the design patterns um, and going into the benefits uh, and I have sort of um, made this like shared some of the benefits as we speak about it uh, but it you can use like a better use of the object oriented principles uh, and these are pretty standard I even if you talk about dependency injection with a person in a in a Java framework, in a .NET framework, they would still understand it. So, uh, and the problem Piyush was talking about, onboarding people from outside into Drupal, it becomes easy because it, you use common terms, common vocabulary, 
the code becomes maintainable um, and as we saw it becomes testable because components are very loosely loosely coupled and the integration between the third party systems like symphony or ck editor it becomes a little easy because those like symphony heavily relies uh, implements the best standards and everything and uh, talking about imp implementation of best standards best php standards and by the third party libraries in uh, in used by drupal core let's move on to the next topic uh, which is like a final topic of the session which is like php 8 and how it affects drupal uh, core right thanks ajit uh, so uh, so far what we have seen is drupal 8 and 8 plus has brought in object oriented programming with php in and taken in certain components from symphony as well as certain other uh, uh, other standard php libraries into its core right now it becomes more and more important for drupal to stay up to date with what php versions uh, are getting released because you're dealing with certain dependencies which might be dependent on different php versions they might upgrade themselves and uh, and drupal might not be able to upgrade itself because the bare minimum uh, PHP requirement for, let's say, a plugin is PHP 8.1, while for Drupal it stays 7.3, right? You can't uh, import or you can't upgrade uh, that package within Drupal Core because your Drupal Core is not compatible with latest version of PHP, right? So this becomes more and more important, is what I would say. That's one part of it. Secondly, with newer versions of PHP, uh, there are newer features which are coming in. There are newer RFCs which are which are getting uh, implemented, right? To be able to leverage those, uh, your Drupal core needs to be more compatible with uh, with newer PHP versions, right? What we're going to do here is take a look at a few PHP 8 features. How Drupal 8 is uh, is uh, sorry, how Drupal 10 is. Um, uh, or what changes Drupal 10, uh, 10 is making in its core to make itself compatible and be ready with uh, PHP 8.2, which is going to be released in November, but still uh, the efforts that we're trying to make here, right? So uh, this is one of the first one, which is named arguments. Uh, I mean, all of us would have written functions. They would have had arguments within them, but uh, uh, has anyone run into a situation wherein you were pars passing the function when calling the function, you're passing the arguments in a different order. L that was right. And then you see an error uh, if, the, if it's type hinted properly. Uh, you see an early error if it's not type hinted. You see a la uh, uh, error pretty late in the cycle, right? Uh, with PHP 8, you don't really need to worry about it anymore. So what we have with PHP 8 is uh, you have named arguments, which means that while calling a function, you say you pass it in a key value pair which says that the value that you're passing in maps with this argument right so if you look at this example we have a function foo which ha which takes in four different arguments a b c d um, and uh, while we're invoking this function we're passing it in a uh, passing the arguments in a different order right but it's keyed with the parameter name right so you no longer need to worry about it Along with that, there's a uh, sugary syntax there, uh, wherein you see there's a question mark before string, right? Wherein it says, uh, when PHP, so in PHP 8, you could go ahead and say that this type of, uh, I mean, the argument type can be uh, of this type or it could be null, right? And uh, there are a lot of other syntactical changes, but we're not going to cover all of them in this session. But uh, we'll try to go through a few while they come and uh, come across in the examples. Uh, deprecated dynamic properties. So uh, how many of you have created an object of a class and uh, then defined a dynamic property on top of it? By dynamic property, I mean a property which has not declared in the class itself. So for example, I have a, uh, I have a class A, which has two different properties, B and C, right? Now I've instantiated an object of class A, and I do dollar $A uh, arrow operator D is equals to 10. I think a lot of us would have done that, right? Uh, there are examples of this in Drupal core as well. But with PHP 8, uh, uh, 
there's a uh, there's a deprecation warning that you will start running into which would say that uh, you're not allowed to define a dynamic property on an object anymore right let's take a look at an example from drupal core so uh, this is a your config entity based class all of us would have seen uh, the specific statement wherein uh, we copy the original entity object before saving and it's available with the original key right here original is a dynamic property on your entity object which is not declared in your uh, in your entity based class right and uh, if it stays in drupal core and uh, we ship we uh, uh, drupal 10 is released and we're running drupal 10 on php 8.2 our logs would be full of certain er uh, full of warnings, deprecation warnings, saying that uh, this is no longer supported. Now the solution to this is uh, so since this is a deprecation, it's going to get it's going to uh, be completely unsupported with PHP 9. Since this is a deprecation, PHP also gives you a way to make it ba backward compatible by allowing you to have uh, attributes. Now uh, what you see in the patch on the right. There's an attribute added in a certain format, which is which is quite new, I would say. Uh, how many of you have seen this uh, the syntax? Okay, quite a few. Great. So uh, we'll discuss about what it is in in, a, in the next uh, slide as well. But yeah, this is an attribute which allows you to say that basically I'm going to allow dynamic properties on this class, right? And uh, that's the patch applied to config entity base to support it. Uh, with uh, Drupal 10, uh, and here's a link to the uh, to the meta issue, which talks about how and where uh, these dynamic properties are being handled in Drupal Core. Um, there's another one which is in discussion uh, using weak maps for container serialization problem. So uh, uh, with Drupal with Drupal 8, uh, all of the service objects which we were creating or instantiating. Right, they had a dynamic attribute called as underscore service ID. Now this service ID was uh, was leaking across different service definitions, leading to leading to bad garbage collection, I would say, right? Because uh, even if an object is no longer referenced, it was still in the memory because uh, because your serv your uh, service ID has been has leaked across multiple service definitions, right? Well, the solution to this has been done has been uh, brought in uh, Drupal 9.5.x, wh uh, wherein uh, we've started using uh, special object storage, wherein every service instantiation is also followed with creating a hash map of the object, so that you have a unique ID in your uh, unique ID for pointing to every service object, right? And this allows you to also uh, do the garbage collection better wherein uh, these these unique IDs will be garbage collected once they're not referenced anymore. Uh, proposition for 10.x is to use weak maps. Now, the only difference between, or the basic difference between special object storage and weak maps is special object storage uh, stores your hard links, whereas uh, hard references, wherein uh, weak maps store weak references, which means that uh, weak maps would do an a garbage collection on its own. Weak map would go ahead and check that if uh, if an object is no longer referenced by a piece of by a piece of the code, go ahead and remove it from the memory, right? Also, weak maps allow allows you to have objects as keys, which means you don't have to create a different hash of the object. Rather, you can have your entire object as the key for the map. So this is a new data type introduced with PHP 8, and uh, uh, there's a the discussion and more details on this available on this issue queue. Now coming back to attributes, one of the attributes that we saw previously was to allow dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, properties on classes. But uh, attributes are, uh, are a replacement of annotations, I would say. So uh, you must have, everyone must have seen when you're defining plugins, you write certain uh, annotations in your doc block which requires a doctrine annotation uh, plugin to be able to parse it and store the metadata within Drupal, right? Um, with PHP 8, this the now with PHP 8, attributes have come into picture instead of annotations for defining it. 
which means you don't you would no longer need a doctrine annotations library to parse the annotations rather you could have the metadata getting passed by php core itself right now drush has already started implementing it which means that uh, uh, your drush command files would no longer require you to define your uh, options help usage arguments etc in annotations rather you could use attributes to define them so drush has already adopted i think uh, it might sooner or later start getting adopted in drupal core as well uh now one of the basic ones which is uh, defining type hints so whenever uh, uh, wherever possible uh, there's a policy for this as well uh, on drupal core on drupal.org which talks about define type hints wherever possible right because what type hints allow us to do is uh, number one uh, have early warnings in the code base in your uh, application execution right so uh, everyone must be familiar with this way of declaring a property on an on a on a class right now this can change to the one that you see on the right which is more condensed and uh, you could define you could type hint your properties and you no longer would also require to provide another doc block for saying what type of property this uh, this variable is right um, same thing for return types on functions and uh, the policy draft for drupal 10 is right here on the link uh, below now you may already know drupal 10 uh, is going to require php 8.1 right because drupal 10 would require symphony 6.1 which basically depends on uh, php 8.1 at the same time drupal 10 will be compatible with php 8.2 now PHP 8.2 is supposed to be released in November 22, but there are already efforts being made to make it compatible, right? What this means for us is uh, we will have larger support lifetime for Drupal 10 because uh, we're already on the latest version of PHP and uh, other dependencies might, uh, uh, I mean, other depend it would be much easier for us to uh, say that Drupal 10 will have a longer lifetime with these dependencies as well which uh, which Drupal core depends on, right? We have newer ways of writing uh, more robust code, right? Type hints everywhere. And with upgrade to Drupal 10, you should make a consideration of upgrading to PHP 8.1 as well. Now the community has already made a lot of efforts in listing down uh, what are the hosting and distributions uh, uh, support and timelines for supporting PHP 8.1 for, for certain uh, hosting platforms which is available on the link below. But yeah, uh, I think that's all it's going to take us to move to Drupal 10 and uh, have it compatible with PHP 8.2, right? Uh, I would close the session with, uh, with, with this uh, notion that Drupal, 8, Drupal 10 is going to be compatible with PHP 8.2. It's going to take some efforts, and uh, I think uh, uh, it's going to take, uh, take efforts from all of us uh, to contribute back and make sure that Contrib is compatible with PHP 8 as well. Like uh, the, the deprecation warnings or uh, dynamic attributes problem which we're seeing, right? It has to be handled across Contrib as well, right? With this, uh, I'll open the floor for questions. Uh, any questions, guys? I get the oh, we do have time, Return. right? Return. Any question? No one. I think here one. <laughs> Do you know what the plans are uh, about using the new constructors in PHP 8 to define the properties within a class? Uh, you Is mean uh, uh, property promotions? Uh, with constructors, yes. Um, I think the idea uh, the idea to support uh, PHP 8.2 at this stage is to make Drupal as much as compatible as possible, 
And then uh, the next steps would be to bring in the new the goodies that are coming with PHP 8 yeah. into Drupal 10. Okay. Thanks. Noah? In that case, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Have a good day. Uh, please consider filling the session survey. Thank you.